We had waited on the list for over a year, wondering if Dan would live long enough to see a new heart. He's a husband, a stepfather, a friend, a superhero, a historian, a teacher, a lightsaber warrior, a carrier of all the things. To lose him would have been crippling. My heart wasn't formed properly, and they could tell right away at birth when I was born. I was very blue. It was in college when my heart really started to fail. I was 22 years old. I got my first transplant and then got to go back home, and it was incredible. I mean, a completely new life. I started going to a local hospital in Charlotte, and I eventually got diagnosed with uh, CAV it can sometimes start to warp your arteries and they would start to close. They put me on medicine that prevents it from progressing. After starting that medicine, it got a little better. So basically in my mind is, I don't have to worry about this. It was at that point in time, I got into the best shape of my life. We were going to boot camp type style workout. I felt incredible. I was at a point where I would only see my cardiologist once a year. I was so excited to go see them and be like, look at this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> we went, we sat down and they're like, the CAV progressed. They told us that we're probably gonna have to go back on the, on the heart transplant list. Took us by surprise, for sure. So we got listed in December and we were on all the way through the summer. He looked at me and he said, I don't think I'm gonna survive the surgery if I make it that long. And at that point, we just knew that what we were doing was not, we were doing ourselves a disservice to not explore all of our options. Dan was already listed in another transplant center, but his complication was uh, vasculopathy and he needed a re-transplant. In the current system that's used to allocate hearts to potential recipients, it's actually a fairly low priority. Because there are more people that need hearts than there are hearts available, most people need to wait until they're very sick in the hospital, sometimes on devices, until they can actually find a suitable donor. Um, and so that's why we really encouraged him to think about the other programs that we can offer. The first thing he said was, we don't want to wait till you get sicker. We want to we want to do this when you're healthy and when you can be the most successful with it. We have a couple different ways we try to do that. One of those ways is, is using the transmetic system. Right now, most places are limited by how far we can safely travel and keep the heart on ice. We try to keep the entire time that the heart's out of the body on ice to four hours or less. With the transmetic system, what, what is happening is that the heart has a pump where the pump is going to pump blood back into the heart and it allows the heart to um, be in a more normal metabolic state for much longer. And, and so we're really not, we don't have those time constraints and we've been able to travel really far, Puerto Rico, Wyoming, Canada, and really expand where we might go for donors. The other way was through the DCD program. Uh, that's a great way for people to get transplanted because there aren't a lot of centers that offer that. And so um, if any donor does become available through that program, there's much less competition. And, and that's how he was able to be transplanted from home, um, come in, have his surgery, and get back to living. I love to just experience things, life. It's being able to spend more time with your family. I didn't want that to end and that gave me a lot of motivation to, you know, to fight. It's challenging, but there's, there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel.